Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar that nonprofit filing deadline is more important than you thought. My name is Ling, and I'm the membership director at California Association of Nonprofits, Cal Nonprofits for short. I would like to introduce Jen Masaoka, Cal Nonprofits CEO, and our moderator for today. Take it away, Jen. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, you know, having more than 500 people here today really says something about the power of uh, in this Zoom communication. It's great to have everybody here. I'm going to start by just letting you know what the folks we have on today. And I, it really makes me happy that we have kind of the people who really know this stuff. So we have two people from the Franchise Tax Board, Audrey Rowe and Victoria Ramirez. Um, and from the Attorney General's Office, we have Tanya Ibanez. Tanya runs the Charitable Trust Division of the Attorney General's Office, which is in charge with overseeing the nonprofit community from a legal perspective. And, yeah, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, it says a lot about all three of these people that they're willing to, to come to spend this kind of time when they could have been having another, you know, peppermint latte. And instead, they're here with us, uh, ready to answer questions. I know they've done a lot of preparation. And it says a lot about, um, you know, government officials making themselves accessible to nonprofits. I, I just want to make a couple of framing comments to let people know why we're doing this webinar, particularly now. Um, you may have seen some headlines like this. So for example, this in the San Francisco Standard did this, had this has had a couple of stories saying San Francisco paid 25 million to revoke or delinquent nonprofits. And Fox News has had a couple of stories saying that, you know, some Nancy Pelosi related nonprofits have been out of compliance. And I think that only recently, so that has it come to the attention of the press that this website is available so that any member of the public can look up and see whether a particular nonprofit is delinquent or not. And so it makes a great, head, great headline. In some cases, some of the nonprofits that they're pointing out are kind of fake nonprofits, but nonetheless, it's an easy headline for them to put. Um, and this has really awakened the attention of many, many government funding officials across California, both state, county, and city levels, and other levels as well, as well as a lot of private funders, as, uh, including some of the online fundraising platforms. And so there's been a sudden rush of attention to whether or not nonprofits are delinquent. So um, th these we're not going to be telling you some new regulations that just happened. These are regulations and websites that have been in place for many years, but they've only come to attention now. This, these kinds of headlines is what's awakened a lot of funding officials. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> And I just want to make sure that we're to people and understand that there are forms due to the federal government, the Internal Revenue Service, but also to the state. And in the state, there are three separate offices that forms have to be filed with. We are not going to be talking about the IRS requirements today, just about the state of California requirements. Okay, and next, next slide. So, you know, last year I was doing a webinar about something and I thought, you know, I'll just use the California Association of Nonprofits as an example to show what the website looks like. And look what happened when I did that. I found out that we were delinquent. Um, so I thought, well, actually, this makes a better example for the webinar than if we had been current. Um, and so, of course, I immediately talked to the people in our accounting department and, you know, we got it fixed within a very short period of time. But I just wanted to show you what it looks like when you're delinquent. And it not only tells you, you know, what that you're just delinquent in general, but it'll tell you what particular forms you're delinquent on. Now, in this particular case, we thought that we had sent it in, but the office says that they never got it. So that happens in this world. We know that happens. So I just wanted to, uh, to let you know that this happens to people and you may have been delinquent for a decade or more um, and just weren't aware of it. So we'll tell you how more about how to figure that out next. Um, I, I want to remind people uh, two things. First of all, please put your um, questions in the Q&A box. If you look down at the bottom, you'll see a little uh, icon that says Q&A. You can put them there. And I'm asking our panelists to go ahead and answer them when they're not talking, if they see ones that they can answer. Um, and all of you should be able to look at the questions and answers too, so you can see what's going on. Okay, and um, but with 500 people on today's webinar, uh, we're not going to be able to get to everybody's questions, just a reminder. So we're going to take a couple of questions after Tanya's talk, then a couple after Victoria and Audrey, and then we'll open up to questions. So uh, they, I know they have a lot to say. So um, let's start with Tanya. Tanya, take it away. 
So the first thing I want to um, just remind everyone is please, please look at our website. We really have a good website. Mm -hmm. um, we have webinars, we have the Attorney General's Guide for Charities, we have the latest forms and instructions, we have frequently asked questions, and most importantly, we have the registry verification search, which is what Jan used in order to find out that Cal Nonprofits was delinquent. And that is the, the website down there, um, rct.doj.ca.gov. So um, if you're a charity and you're operating in California, you are required to register and file annual reports with our office. Um, we also require charitable fundraisers to register. And also there's gonna be certain transactions during the, the lifespan of your organization that you may need to get um, notice or approval to the attorney general. So again, I urge you all to look at the guide for charity so that you can stay on top of your filing requirements. Um, but basically the filing requirements with our office are handled by the Registry of Charitable Trust and they're located in Sacramento. And again, the statute that requires registration is government code 12580. The statutes and all regulations applicable to charities are on our website. Next slide. So what's the whole point of the attorney general's oversight? Uh, one is to protect charitable assets. The other is to make sure that donations aren't misused or squandered. We are also tasked by the legislature to ensure that your annual reports are available to the public viewing on our website. Um, and again, the point of the registry is to promote transparency. Next slide. So how do you start the initial registration process? And when do you start initial registration process? Well, you're supposed to be registered with our office within 30 days of receiving property. And that can include cash, non-cash donations, grants, loans, donated services. So once you've received charitable property, what you need to do in order to start the registration process with our office is you file the CT1 form. You send us copies of your articles, your bylaws, your IRS, IRS form 1023, uh, and the IRS determination letter if you have it available. And the initial registration process, this applies not only to organizations that were formed by the Secretary of State in California, but it also applies to foreign charitable organizations that are doing business in California. And when we mean about doing business is either they're actively soliciting here, they're targeting uh, California donors, they have offices here, they're pr uh, providing programs in California. Those, if you're doing that and you're a foreign organization, then you would need to register. Um, also, um, folks that are soliciting donations as unincorporated associations, let's say you didn't get your tax exemption from the Franchise Tax Board and you haven't gone to the Secretary of State, but you're a group of folks and you're soliciting donations and you're, you're acting basically as a charitable trustee, you would also need to register with our office. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a webinar that's available on our website that will take you through the steps in the initial registration process. Next slide. Um, in addition to doing the initial registration, you are required to renew your registration each year. And you do this by filing the RRF1 form with the required registration fee. And we also need a copy of your IRS Form 990 or 990 easy or PF when your revenue is above 50,000. If your revenue is below 50,000 uh, and you don't file the 990 easy or PF, we require that you file the form CTTR-1 form. Um, these forms are all available on our website. I encourage you all to use the latest forms that are on our website to avoid any problems. Uh, next slide. So what happens if you don't renew your registration with our office? Well, you will eventually be listed as delinquent. Now our office, we, we're not trigger happy. We are not uh, chomping at the bit to make you delinquent. We automatically assume that you have received a six month extension from the IRS. Mm -hmm. So you will not be listed as delinquent if you're within that six month period. And then we also will give you 
a couple of months because we're figuring, well, maybe things have been delayed because of the mail. So you likely will not be listed as delinquent until about eight to 10 months after your due date. So, you yeah. know, but stay on top of things. You don't want to get in that position of being delinquent because the whole world will see that you're delinquent. And there's consequences for delinquency. One of them is late fees can be assessed. The other thing is loss of tax exemption. Uh, we will notify Audrey's uh, team that uh, these charities are delinquent. And so the Franchise Tax Board will likely send a letter to your organization saying that if you don't cure your problems, you may lose your tax exemption. Also, if you don't cure the delinquency, you may be suspended or revoked. So again, loss of donations and reputations, it's important to stay on top of your filing requirements. Next slide, please. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, all of your records and your status are available on our website. So it's important that you look at the website um, and some of, uh, some of the organizations have contacted us and said, well, I didn't know I was delinquent. No one told me that uh, my organization was delinquent. Well, the registry doesn't have a legal requirement to notify your organization that it's delinquent. We have started a process where we'll send postcards to charities saying, hey, your filings are late. Um, if we don't get them with a certain period of time, you're going to be uh, suspended. But again, the registry doesn't have a legal obligation to notify or send anything to organizations. So it's really important that you go to our website and see what your status is. And also just so that you know, charities have an obligation to update their mailing address with us. So if you have a change in staff and you think, wow, I might not have gotten the notices, it's important that you uh, tell us what your new address is. And you can file an RRF1 form and just there's a, a, a box on the right hand side that says amended and you can just give us your new address or you can email the registry. Next slide. So some of the definitions on our website, uh, folks have always asked us, what does current awaiting reporting mean? Well, this means that you're still within that six month period of the IRS extension, but we haven't received anything. So this is a clue to you that, hmm, I better get our stuff into the registry because while they're giving me the current status, the, the clock is ticking here. Mm -hmm. uh, current in process means basically we received your documents and they're in process of being reviewed and we're giving you the benefit of the doubt that everything is, is, is accurate. And so we're listing you as current. Uh, current reporting incomplete is an important status to know. This means we've received one document, but we're still missing something. So maybe we received the RRF1 form, but you haven't given us your IRS Form 990 or your CTTR1 form. So it's important for you to uh, check your statuses. Uh, next slide, please. Risky statuses. Uh, these are statuses where you may be in trouble. Uh, you may not be able to get your donations from GoFundMe uh, and platform charities because you are delinquent or you're revoked or you're suspended or you're not registered. Now, not registered means we never got anything. And it's, it's quite possible that you don't need to register if you're, for example, a church or a school or a hospital but most charities operating in California are required to be registered. Uh, not registered subject to cease and desist order means you already got on our radar and we sent you a cease and desist order because we sent several notices to register and you ignored us. Um, delinquent, I've already covered that. Uh, delinquent late uh, fees due, uh, it may be that you cured everything, but you haven't paid the late fees. Revoked and suspended means you've been delinquent for a long time. You've already gotten your notice of suspension and you didn't cure it. And so if you don't cure your suspension within one year, you will be revoked. Uh, next slide, please. So how do you search um, your status? Well, if you go to our website, oag.ca.gov, forward slash charities, and you go under resources and tools, you'll see something that says registry verification search. 
So here is what you need to do. You put in your either your state charity registration number, and that's our number that starts with a CT, or you can use the um, SOS number, which usually starts with a C, or your FEIN number, or your name, and just click search. Next slide. And this is what it'll look like once you get to your portal. So if you see on the top left-hand corner, the registry status is current. That's good news uh, for this organization. If you look on the top right-hand corner, it says renewal due expiration date. This means that this organization on May 15, 2023 is going to need to send their renewal records for 2021. And if you look under filings and correspondence, you see the, the founding documents, renewal filings in blue ink. Those are basically the filings that the registry has received. If you click onto those, they're hyperlinked and they will take you to the documents that have been filed by your organization. And then if you look under annual renewal data, this basically tells you what happened with each filings. And this is a really important area because if you are delinquent, if you see on the bottom under annual renewal data, there's notes from registry staff. And that's where the registry will basically tell you what's missing. Um, and we've been putting notes in there, but if you go to the next slide, let me explain a little bit more. So here's the annual renewal data. And as you can see, uh, for the first fiscal beginning on 2012, uh, it says why under 990, that means we received everything. There's data under the RRF1 panel, that means we received that information as well. And it shows that it was accepted. So there was no problems with those filings. Following to the fiscal year beginning in 2013, you see that it was rejected. And if you look above the term rejected, it says N under complete 990. That means we didn't get the 990s for that year. And then the following year where it says not submitted, you see that there's no documents that were received. And in the year that says incomplete, again, it shows that we didn't get a complete copy of the 990s. Um, and then the last one in process, it shows that we got everything and it's in process of being reviewed. Next slide, please. So some of the issues, um, again, this is just accepted means we got everything, it's complete. Rejected means something's wrong. We're either missing the RRF1 form or you didn't pay the renewal fees. Incomplete is one document is missing. Not submitted means we got nothing. And in process means we got everything uh, and it's under review. Next slide. So again, we have a delinquency webinar on our website, so please, you know, feel free to look at that uh, webinar at your leisure. Next slide. So some of the problems, the frequent problems that we have in annual renewals is that folks are using outdated forms. Uh, we have new forms. These new forms have been on our website from 2021, uh, but unfortunately folks somehow are still using outdated forms. So please go to our website to use the latest forms. Also follow all of the instructions on the forms. Uh, filing something with um, quotation marks, not sure or not applicable or, or, or not filling in all the blanks will get uh, the organization's filings rejected. Um, uh, so please avoid blank forms, uh, fill in everything and make sure that you give us all the records that we need. Uh, that would include the RRF1 form or the IRS form 990 or the CTTR-1 form if you have less than $50,000 in revenue. And please don't forget the registration fee. It has to be payable to the Department of Justice. Next slide, please. Um, not, another problem that we have is folks forget to sign the RRF1 form. Please sign and date it. Next slide, please. So a lot of you have asked, how do we file? Well, you can either file through regular mail or registered mail at our PO box or you can overnight deliver it to the registry. If you do mail documents, make sure that you have your CT number. Uh, sometimes we will get a, a charity that's filed everything, but they forgot to give us their registration fee. And then they send in a check, but we don't know who this check pertains to. There's no number on the memo part of the check. There's no name of the charity on the memo part of the check. 
So please, if you got a delinquency notice, put it in the, the envelope. You can put all of your documents in one envelope. That would be you know, very helpful for us to process your filings. Uh, next slide, please. So processing times. A lot of folks complain about our processing times. The good news is we are hiring people. We have hiring people. So while our website says that our processing will take anywhere between 30 to 90 days, the truth of the matter is that we're now at 30 days. But if you want to know why it takes so long, and that is because we have 100,000 charities that are registered with our office. And I don't have 1,000 employees. I don't even have 100 employees. Uh, it's closer to 50 and 60 employees. So, and on any given month, we get between 10,000 to 20,000 pieces of mail. So uh, my best recommendation to you is file early. Uh, you'll be ahead of the game if you file early. Folks like to wait until May or November. That is our high season. That's, those are the months where we get 20,000 pieces of mail during the month. So check your status online and file early. Um, also, if you're organization is listed as current, file online. You will get faster service. We will process it quicker. You will be able to pay your registration fees either through an ACH transfer from the bank or through credit card. Um, so it's important for you to use technology to get your processing done quicker. Um, don't wait to be delinquent and then expect expedited service. It's just we don't have enough staff to do that. Uh, next slide. I just wanted to highlight some of the webinars that are available. And here's another slide that uh, webinar that's available. Uh, we have a webinar that tells you how to fill out the CTTR1 form. Next slide. Uh, if your organization is revoked, you will have to petition for reinstatement and the petition needs to be sent to the registrar. Um, and you will likely be put on probationary status for a while. Next slide. And then contacts, please uh, send emails to the registry. I know some of you like to send multiple emails, not a good idea. Uh, one email is plenty. Uh, we have about 2000 emails uh, every day. So if you're sending us five emails, it's not very helpful for our staff. So um, thank you very much. Happy to entertain questions now or later. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I, I do really want to encourage people to read this. It is really great material. And the the, uh, the, the video re presentations on how to fill out certain forms are very helpful. I really want to recommend them. Um, uh, Tanya, we have a lot of, we're just going to ask you a couple questions before we go on to Audrey. We have a lot of questions based people basically saying something similar, which is that they're trying to cure a delinquency um, and they, they feel like they've submitted something, but they haven't heard back. And is there anything they can do to find out if it's happening or what should they expect? So right now I've been told that delinquency um, uh, is the delinquency unit takes about 30 days to process all the documents. But again, it depends on how uh, bad the delinquency is. Um, if all you're doing is missing an RR1 form or you didn't sign it, that's something that you can email uh, mm -hmm. to the registry and that can be remedied very quickly. But unfortunately, a lot of charities are delinquent for multiple years. And so that does take a lot longer for us to review and process. Okay. And um, uh, is there a phone number or something like that where people can call if they're feeling really worried because, for example, they may have a contract they need to sign uh, in a, just a couple of days and they've only now discovered that they're delinquent? Um, I will put um, uh, an email in the in the chat, mm -hmm. which will have the um, the supervisor for the delinquency unit and that they can email her. If they have a grant that uh, is in peril, um, they can email her and we, we can attempt to try to find their filings. Thank a you. lot of times um, I will say folks tell us that they have a grant and we do require that they give us an, you know some evidence that they have a grant in peril. So don't use this option just because you want uh, to skip over the line or anything like that. We really need to know that uh, your organization is about to lose a grant because of its delinquent status. Thank you. Um, do you want us to bring a bill to increase funding for your office? 
that would be lovely. <laughs> I have to say, I just got stopped dead in my tracks with your phrase, 2000 emails a day. I mean, that, uh, that's got to be very daunting. Yeah, well, and, and a lot of times it's the same organization that's emailed five times. Right. So, um, you know. Great, thank you. All right, so next we're going to hear from Audrey um, and Victoria from the Franchise Tax Board. Um, take it away, Audrey and, and Victoria. Okay, can you guys all hear me? Just a quick thumbs up. Yes. Good, okay. Um, I'm Audrey Rowe, with me is Victoria. She'll probably share her, her screen in a moment. Um, we're with the California Franchise Tax Board. So we're the state agency that governs the income tax in California. And we also offer income tax exemptions for those qualified nonprofits. Now I know I've only got 15 minutes to talk. So we're gonna start with the presumption that you have income tax exemption, but we'll end with a slide that has all my contact information. So if you're struggling with the exemption or you know you realize you don't have it um, you'll have information on how to reach out to me and I'll guide you on that so we'll discuss what you need to file um, the thing the other things that may be due with our department how to check your status because it's very important that you keep on top of that um, and what to do when things go wrong next slide please okay so how what and when to file. First thing you need to do is determine what your own filing requirement is, and it is based on the type of exemption that you have. So for example, if um, you look at your exempt determination letter or your exempt um, acknowledgement letter, and you see that you're a church or similar entity, such as a temple or a mosque or a synagogue, you do not have an annual filing requirement with us. Um, you may have to file a tax return if you have some side unrelated income, but the annual income um, information returns aren't required. Everybody else is required to file something with us annually, um, but what they file depends upon how large they are. Um, we do base the um, largeness of an organization on your gross receipts. We use a three-year average, so the last two years plus the current year, divide that by three. And if the amount is $50,000 or below, we consider you a small entity and you can file the FTD 199N. If your income is above the $50,000 mark, you're going to file the, the standard form 199. The form itself is just a two-page form, um, but it can get quite large if you've got lots of attachments or explanations or schedules or things like that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, how to file the form. Now, we did look at some of the, the questions that were posed ahead of time. And one of the questions was, is there a preferred app to use? Um, or did they have to file or find a CPA to file these forms? Um, now, I know that there is some software out there. Obviously, I can't recommend anyone's software over the other. But I can tell you that our website does contain PDFs for all of the forms. And they are all specifically designed so that the average person can fill them out, um, you know, the instructions are there um, written in a way that you don't need a professional. Not to say that you won't need an accountant or an attorney if you're very, very large and maybe you have some complex um, financial situations going on, but it is all designed so that the average person can fill it out. Now, our website, it's ftb for franchise tax board.ca.gov. And if you search for charities, you're going to land on our charities and nonprofits page that's going to have links to um, what the filing requirements are. And it'll go through that three year average. It'll talk about when you may have a taxable requirement to file a Form 100 or Form 109. Um, it also contains links to all of those forms, the PDF links. You can either print those out, fill it out by hand and mail it in, or you could download a copy of that PDF um, and fill it out and, on, and submit it either as an e-file or by mailing it in. It also has the portal to the 199N. Now I know the 199N, it's not actually a form. There's no physical representation of it. It's more like doing a survey online where you type in the total amount of receipts for that year. You check a few boxes to indicate that you're not going out of business and you indicate who's filling it out and then met your filing requirement for it. Now there has been a change somewhat recent. I know um, 
oh, well, it should say 2021. Um, beginning in 2021, there was a law change that allowed us to eliminate filing fees, um, found that basically the $10 filing fee cost us more as a department to process than um, it was worth. So we were able to get that filing fee waived. So if you've been filing for a long time and all of a sudden you're starting to get that $10 check back, um, it's because you no longer have a filing fee. You will still have penalties if the one ninety is significantly late. Okay, next slide, please. All right, when to file. I would love to give an absolute hard deadline, but the reality is um, we don't dictate that your um, nonprofit have any particular year end. There are many nonprofits that work with children that choose a June 30th year end, others will choose a calendar year end. So I can tell you that our filing deadline, the original due date is four and a half months after the close of your taxable year. But if you're not suspended, you have an automatic six month extension. So calendar year taxpayers, you're looking at filing by May 15th um, with an extended due date of November 15th. Now, if you blow past that filing deadline, it's not the end of the world. Um, we still expect you to file that return, but we do assess a penalty. That penalty is limited, however, because we don't want you to spend too much of the money that you receive for your nonprofit function on paying penalties, so it is capped at $40 a year. Now, there is no penalty for filing the 199N late. Um, unfortunately, we frequently see those filed late, but you don't want to push that too far past the, the deadline because if you go three years without filing, you will end up losing your income tax exemption. Um, next slide, please. And then in addition to those returns, there are some other things that may be due. Um, if you filed, for example, the 199 late, um, we're going to assess that, um, that late filing penalty. We'll send you a bill. If the bill's not paid, we start to send kind of um, stronger language notices. You must file this. Um, if it goes too far beyond not payment, you will end up getting a pre-suspension notice to advise you um, you know, that you're about to be suspended and lose your exemption. My best recommendation is if you're getting a bill for a return or you're getting a filing enforcement for a return and you believe you filed it, please reach out to us. We can look in our system, try to figure out what, get, what went wrong and correct the problem before it becomes um, a big, bigger problem. So definitely reach out to us because we don't just send billing notices for no reason. All right. Um, in addition to the late filing of the 199, sometimes people will send in their taxable returns um, indicating that they have unrelated income, but they don't actually pay that amount. Uh, you will end up being suspended for non-paying. So if you filled out the 109 or the 100 in error, maybe you have a new treasurer and they just selected the wrong form and you're getting notices, reach out to us. We can have you file an amended one to report zero and guide you towards the correct form. Um, in addition to our own penalties, Secretary of State does issue a penalty for late filing of the Statement of Information. That's the um, $50 for the SI-100 for domestic corporations, and I believe $250 for late filing for the foreign corporations. But the Secretary of State does not actually have collectors, so they send that to the Franchise Tax Board to assess. Um, so if you are getting notices from us saying um, you owe a Secretary of State penalty and you think you don't, please reach out. Um, we can guide you on how to request a penalty waiver, um, but we can't just drop the fee if we don't hear from you. All right, next slide, please. All right, as promised, how to check your FTB status. This is a little screenshot from our website, the ftb.ca.gov. Again, you search for charities and you land on our charities and nonprofits page. Um, in addition, and I'll show you in just a moment how to check your status. Um, if you see on the lower left-hand portion, it's all about the filing requirements, introduction to tax exempt status that walks you through the process of applying for exemption or reapplying if you've lost exemption. It talks about the various types of exemptions. Everybody thinks of charities, but there's many, many, many more types of nonprofits out there that do qualify for exemption. So for checking your entity status, it's at the lower right-hand section, kind of the arrow is pointing to that one. It says entity status letter. Next slide, please. 
you click on um, you click in the entity status letter and it's going to ask you for your seven digit California corporation number. Now, ideally, um, you would have this number handy, but if you don't, you can do a name search on Secretary of State website or the Attorney General's website. But I just want to strongly caution to make sure you're finding your entity. We have a lot of organizations that find entities with a name that kind of sounds like theirs, but isn't theirs. And so they start looking at the status and applying for exemption for an entity that is nowhere near related to them. So definitely make sure it's your entity. Once you enter in that seven digit number and check your status, what you're specifically looking for is for it to say the words active and exempt. If you see anything else such as suspended, forfeited, not exempt, you definitely want to be reaching out to us because you're not in good standing and that can have some consequences for you down the road. Now, if you are active and exempt, if you click on that link that says generate letter, it will produce a letter that you can print out with today's date. You're having a fundraiser, you can put that letter right on your table so that anybody coming to visit your fundraiser can see that you're in good standing with the franchise tax board. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, when things go wrong. Um, there are several ways, and I know somebody in the chat and I tried to answer, there are several ways that an organization can lose their income tax exemption. The, the most common way is because of a suspension. So it's not always a result of doing something bad. Sometimes it's just the result of um, maybe you had a high turnover, maybe your treasurer left. Uh, we have unfortunately run into several situations where it is um, elderly individuals running nonprofits and sometimes things that affect the elderly such as Alzheimer's, they forget to file or they thought they filed or nobody can get a hold of the treasurer to find out if they filed. Um, so it is quite common. Um, some of the causes for suspension would be non-filing with Secretary of State. Um, not filing the annual information returns with um, the Franchise Tax Board, such as the 199, um, non-payment non of a balance due, and then um, if you do end up suspend or losing your exemption and you're required to file corporate returns, if you don't file those corporate returns, you can end up suspended. But suspension is just one reason for the revocation. Other reasons could include um, not filing of the 199N. Now, three years of not filing it will cause you to be revoked, but it won't necessarily cause you to be suspended. So you won't have any of the negative implications of being suspended, but you still won't have your current tax exemption. And if not quickly remedied, you will end up suspended. And like Tanya had mentioned, um, if you fall out of compliance with the Registry of Charitable trust, you end up delinquent, they will notify our department. We'll send you a notice that says you have 120 days to get back into good standing. And if you push past that in the 121st day, you do lose your income tax exemption. Uh, next slide, please. But I want to let you know that it's not the end of the world. Um, try to take some of the shame away from it. Um, we do see a lot of nonprofits with a lot of turnover, a lot of situations where I thought you were going to file it. Um, and so we always try to approach it from a clean, clean slate perspective. How can we get you back on the path and doing the things that you should be doing? Uh, around 60% of the Form 3500 exemption applications we receive are for entities that are trying to reinstate their exempt status because they lost it from a suspension or revocation. The best advice is to fix it as soon as you can. The longer you wait, the more side um, implications may hit you, such as um, unable to fundraise. Um, I know we had a very large national level nonprofit that uh, missed out on Giving Tuesday because they were in revoked status and Facebook would not permit them to fundraise. So, um, so it is very important that you get it fixed before you start missing out on opportunities like that. We do have a dedicated nonprofit call center. It is not staffed 24 seven. It's just Monday through Friday, 7.30 to four. Um, but the people that you're talking to are trained specifically on the requirements of nonprofit. So it is the most helpful. And if you are um, able to give us a call within a few months of becoming suspended, sometimes we can reinstate your status without you having to reapply. Beyond the two months, you do need to file a new Form 3500. And um, we like to say um, more is better 
provide documents, articles, bylaws, financials, even if you think we already have a copy, just because if we can get that application and it's complete, we can approve it without having to contact you. It speeds everything up. Um, in addition to filing the 3500, file any missing returns that you know about. That's where calling our help center will help. They can let you know exactly which returns are missing. And of course, you want to come back into compliance with the Secretary of State and the AG. Now, when we review the application, we don't deny it automatically. If we see anything is missing, we reach out. We try to reach out based on the way that you indicated you preferred it. So if um, you don't indicate an email is your best method to contact, we'll usually just send a letter. But if we see that email is your best contact, we may just send you an email that says, hey, before we can process the application, you need to file these returns. And it does speed things up tremendously. All right, next slide, please. How can I prevent it? Um, we do run into a lot of nonprofits that have high turnover. It's, it's quite common for charities that involve children. Um, a lot of times, once your child ages out of the program, you move on to other things and the next person comes in. Um, we like to encourage people to keep track of things, maybe keep a binder um, that you hand over to newly appointed officers so they know what to do, when to do it, and all of that. Um, but the number one thing I can encourage is to make sure we have your current address. Um, you'd be surprised how many people um, first file for exemption using a PO box, and then they forget to check that. And they go three, four, five months without checking their PO box. And so they didn't get any of the notices that we sent them, letting them know they needed to file something. Um, when officers change, you want to make sure that whoever the officer is that you want things mailed to is the one that's the primary address. So make sure you keep track of us when there's that change of address. Um, check your status online. I recommend once a year to check it just to make sure it gives you a little bit of assurance that things are going correctly. Um, and then finally, keep a calendar. Keep some sort of a calendar that's dedicated to your nonprofit so that you can see all those key deadlines and things that need to occur um, just to make sure that you stay on the right path. Now, every so often, you're going to find yourself in some sort of an urgent situation. And we do have an office that's dedicated to assisting taxpayers. It's our advocate office, and it is staffed by people like Victoria here. Next slide. Thanks, Audrey. Yes, I'm Victoria. I work in the Franchise Tax Board's Advocate Office. We have a really small team. I just wanted to share with you how we can assist you in the future if needed. So our office is primarily responsible for identifying and resolving issues when the normal channels are not working for taxpayers. We also look at systemic issues uh, to improve the way that we do business with taxpayers. And then we also do a lot of education and outreach like our presentation today. Uh, tax news is something I wanted to point out as well. We have thousands of subscribers to our tax news, which is our free online publication. So that's right on our website, search for tax news. And I'd encourage you to subscribe to that. We, we especially in this time of the year, we have uh, tax tips and how to file and tax issues and things like that. So I think just the biggest uh, thing I wanted to point out for you is how to resolve a tax issue when the normal channels aren't working. Um, the Easiest way is to always go through the normal channels because once we take an issue away from those normal channels, uh, then you start going away from the, the people who have the expertise in that. Um, so it does take longer for our office to go and contact those business areas and to try to resolve it after the fact. So if you do get a letter, um, it, you'll probably work with Audrey's team or other teams depending on what the issue is. Um, respond to that to that notice or call the number on the notice because that goes directly to the teams who are in charge of it. If you are confused about the letter, some people think, you know, did it really come from the Franchise Tax Board? Is it a scam? We do have a letters page on our website. Just search for letters and it gives you a whole list of all the notices that we send out to taxpayers, why you receive the notice, how you can resolve the notice and information about it. So that's really helpful. Um, if you can't get your issue resolved that way through the normal channels, uh, the easiest way to contact us is um, through our online portal. So if you go to our website, search for, um, actually it's right on the bottom of our website is our my office, the Taxpayer Advocate Services Office. Um, and then on our website page, there's an uh, unresolved account issues link. 
And so we're able to look at those issues. We have a team that looks at those issues and we can track it, assign it to the right people and send it out. But sometimes that does take more time than just going to the, the people who sent the notice and getting it resolved that way. But just so you know, we do help um, taxpayers who have been struggling through our normal process. Um, so I know we're running out of time. I'll hand it back to Audrey to, uh, to share our contact information. Okay, so last slide. I know you guys are going to get a copy of these slides after the presentation. I encourage you to take this one and print it out. Keep it handy. Um, it does contain the call center um, for our exempt hotline. It also has our mailing address for mailing in things like um, returns applications. And it has um, my contact information as well as Victoria's contact information right there. I do respond to emails. So if you have a specific question that you want to reach out to me, I absolutely absolutely will respond. But if it's a general question, I kind of encourage you to ask it on this platform. Um, that way, when we issue our answer, it can go out to everybody because you'd be surprised if you have a question, chances are a lot of other people have the same question and would benefit from that answer. Uh, so that is the end of our presentation. Back to you guys. Thanks, Victoria and Audrey. Um, you guys, have, I'm telling you, you've all covered so much info in such a long time. Uh, Lauren, who's our communications director, is going to join us, and she's been looking. We now have well over 100 questions have been asked. Um, so, uh, Lauren, can you summarize, uh, combine some of them to maybe the most pressing ones for our speakers? Well, there were a lot of questions about response time, but I think you talked about that and also related to what you do when, you know, as what do you check off as far as if you're um, I'm sorry, if you are uh, filling out your forms and your audit is not complete, but it's, so do you check off that you do do an audit, but it's not complete? There's, there were num numerous questions about that. I'm not sure if that was clear because I'm looking at a couple of different questions. What to do if an audit isn't completed until past the deadline for registering? That's one question related to audits. So I, I think in that such scenario, you would say, no, I don't have it, answer no, but put clarification, um, you know, it will be completed by such and such date. You can also email the registry and say, hey, we're running late with our audit and financial statements, just so that they don't, you know, quickly, you know, turn you over to delinquent. So that, that would be my recommendation. Great. Um, I did want to share that there was a comment about uh, thanking um, the FTB about having a responsive helpline. So I thought that was nice to have something um, positive in there. Um, let's see, what else? Jan, I wanted to ask you this question or anybody else who wants to answer. Um, if a nonprofit shows delinquent, should I not approve them to receive grant funding that is specific for nonprofits? So you know, basically, uh, under our regulations, if a charity is listed as delinquent, that is considered to be not in good standing. And the regulations do say that a charity that is listed as delinquent or suspended or revoked uh, should not be soliciting or operating. So I can't, you know, recommend that you fund or not fund. That is a decision that you as a funder need to make. But being delinquent is an indication that a charity is not being properly operated. So I hate to give this bad news to everyone, <laughs> but I would hope that you would view this in light of, let's stay on top of things. Let's comply with these registration and reporting requirements that are legally mandated. This isn't something that I necessarily um, are wishing ill will to everyone, but this is the law in California. Charities are required to register and report. So it's important to stay on top of things um, and um, use our website to see what, what your charity standing is. I would have to, you know, I would have to say that we have heard some that some foundations uh, talk with the nonprofit prospective grantees. And if they can show that they have that they can send in a copy of what they've done to cure their delinquency, they're going ahead and making the grants. That's, you know, so I just wanted to let you know that that's we're hearing that. Mm -hmm. um, was the due, I might have missed this, was the due date, due date for tax filing extended for charities this year? Somebody wanted to know. No. 
That's the first of all, that's an IRS question, um, not a state question. <laughs> and uh, this is actually an advocacy, you know, as Cal nonprofits, we're an advocacy organization for the nonprofit community. And actually, this is something we took up with the taxpayer advocate at the IRS, which is the fact that they waived late fees for 990 PFs for private foundations, but they did not waive the late fees for non regular nonprofits that file 990s, which enraged us. Um, but uh, we were unsuccessful in getting them to extend that fee waiver to nonprofits. More, more in the, along the lines of the bad news stories. <laughs> uh, another question, is there a penalty if you didn't register with the AG's office within 30 days of receiving assets? Uh, no, I mean, we, we want you to register. So we're, we're I mean, unless, the only penalty that would apply is if you receive multiple notices to register and then we issued a cease and desist order. In that scenario, the cease and desist order usually does have a penalty. But if you voluntarily register with us, you didn't get a notice to register, you're not under cease and desist orders, and you just come up and, and you found out that you should have registered five years ago, we will accept your registration, we will process it. And with the registration package, you will get a yellow letter telling you that you're missing all of these filings that we should have had received five years ago. So, you know, follow the instructions on that letter. It will likely tell you that, you know, since you didn't register five years ago, we need the filings for, you know, 2020, 2021, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I don't have it right in front of me, but I know that somebody had said that they um, only missed one filing in 2020 to 2021, and did that matter, or did they still need to file that? They still need to file it. Yeah. Um, the RRF no longer requires that the schedule, this is part of the question, that the schedule B be attached to the 990. Does this apply to the California Form 199, or are we still required to disclose con contributors who gave 5,000 or more? See, that's, that's for Audrey. That's a, well, that's also an IRS question. It's not really state-related. Oh, okay, because I was seeing that the state form question. Okay. I think I wish the IRS had the same kind of support support videos and language that our California departments do, but they don't. Got it. Can I can I answer a question? I saw it pop up in the chat because I don't see mm. able to answer it. Um, somebody asked about checking entity statuses for entities that were not their own. Um, there is a way. It's um, on our website. This the same place where you check your entity status. There is also an exempt revocations list. So it's more of a negative checking. If you look on that list and you don't see the entity you're checking on, you can assume they're good. Um, but if, if they are on that revocation list, that's the list that these online platforms are now using to identify um, entities that are permitted to fundraise on their platforms. So, um, so that's how you can check is the revocations list. Got it. Um, somebody had asked what they can do, um, how they can check their status with the FTB. They sent their 3500A form in in December, and they're still shown. They're shown as not exempt, and they don't show up on the verification site. Unfortunately, we, like the Attorney General's office, are very thin staffed. You'd be surprised, but there is only about 30 of us working um, the Form 3500s, the 3500As, answering the call center, um, doing all of the various things that our unit does for the nonprofits. Um, we've recently hired some, so the backlog is getting better, but um, having a filing in December not yet be worked is quite common right now, unfortunately. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time for questions. Um, can I just put in one more plug for like putting into your Google calendar, you know, like four times a year or something like that to check your status on, um, uh, because it, and you know, in California, two thirds, you know, Tanya mentioned that we have about 100,000 nonprofits in California, two thirds of them are all volunteer organizations. 
So a lot of times the address changes, right? Because if it's a PTA, like I used to be the treasurer of a PTA, for example, you know, those things change. And so you may be getting a notice that you're a delinquent, but it's going to somebody who was the treasurer last year and they moved to Texas or something like that. So I really want to encourage people to make sure that they do that. Uh, thanks again to our speakers who took time for doing this and just a couple more slides, I think. Um, uh, just this is kind of a quick sheet, cheat sheet um, and just reminding you that we did not bring up a lot of the other forms. For example, if you have employees, there are a lot of forms related to employees. If you hold a raffle, there are forms related to raffle. So we just spoke in this particular webinar about the forms that are related to all nonprofits if they didn't have these specific activities. Okay, next slide. Um, uh, we also have online the nonprofit compliance checklist, which goes over these forms as well as all the federal forms with online links to all of the, not just each form that's due, but also to the instructions for each form. And that's a free service from us. Next slide. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to let people know that we, as a member benefit to Cal Nonprofits members, we have a discount uh, arranged for people that for, use the uh, e-file to be able to form their, to file their Forms 990. Thank you for coming. We hope that you all um, join, become members of Cal Nonprofits, um, and thanks so much for coming. And um, please feel free to contact us at any time with your suggestions for other kinds of uh, webinars. And a reminder, you will also be getting both the slide sets here as well as a recording to the webinar because um, you'll want to watch it time and time again, you know, just like you want to watch Spider-Man again and again. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a great, have a great afternoon. Bye.